Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul, a religious congregation of brothers and priests in the Catholic Church who are dedicated to the use of media to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Today I would like to share with you a few thoughts on the conversion of St. Paul as recounted in the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles is an exciting book that moves from one episode to the next in a very rapid succession. It shows the work of the Holy Spirit moving through human beings and through the world in the very first century in the early years right after the death and resurrection of Christ. The Spirit was able to work wonders in this world. Now, one of the pivotal points in this book is, of course, the conversion or the calling of St. Paul on the road to Damascus. As a young man, he participated in the stoning of St. Stephen, and he wanted to prevent the spread of what he thought was an obvious heresy, the notion that Jesus, a man crucified on Calvary, could have possibly been the Messiah. It made no sense to him. None of the Messianic fulfillments had taken place and where the world would find itself at universal peace, even in the animal world, where the lamb and lion would lie down with one another, where a child could play with a snake. So the notion that Jesus could possibly be the Messiah, well, was out of the question. He was filled with a wrong-hearted zeal. His own teacher, Gamaliel, had warned the Jewish leadership not to in any way resist with violence this new movement because he thought it would die of its own accord. Paul hears that those who followed the way had gone to Damascus, and he was intent on following them there bringing them back and imprisoning them in order to stop the spread of this nonsense doctrine. But something happened on the road to Damascus. He had letters from the religious authorities in Jerusalem to arrest the disciples of Jesus and to bring them back. Now some scholars say this shows that the Acts of the Apostles couldn't possibly be accurate historically because the Jerusalem authorities only had authority around the city itself. In no way did they have any authority in Damascus. However, it's obvious to me that each Roman province was in constant communication with the other province and officials from one place to the next would be able to send letters to their neighbors and say, there's certain criminals that are living in your jurisdiction. Let my men bring them back for trial. If they didn't have this type of extradition agreement, there would be constant chaos in the Roman Empire as rebels and thieves and marauders would simply move from one jurisdiction to the next. So Paul has some authority to do this. Suddenly, as he's traveling that fateful road, He's blinded by a light, and he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And nothing was ever the same again, either for Paul or for the church or for the world. He was blinded and he was helpless, and he had a new perspective on life. Christ was not dead, but was alive and intervening in this world in an ongoing fashion. That was the first shocking truth. The second was that Jesus did not say, why are you persecuting my followers, but why are you persecuting me? And this would form one of the core understandings that Paul had throughout his life that the followers of Jesus were more than just disciples, but they were so closely identified with Jesus that they were his very body 
on earth. An extraordinary understanding of this divine revelation that came to him in that blinding instant. Now, he's led helpless into Damascus. And there is a believing community there waiting for him in fear and trepidation. Ananias, living on Straight Street, receives a vision and a message from the Lord while he's praying, saying to him, Ananias, I want you to accept Saul and to baptize him, to embrace him. And Ananias said, Lord, I've heard from many sources, this man is not good news, but bad news. He has been persecuting us wherever he can, and he is here to do the same for us. And then the Lord says something extraordinary to Ananias. He said, I've chosen him and I will show him how much he will have to suffer for my sake. And this too will become a hallmark of the life of St. Paul and indeed of all believers. That the sufferings that we undergo are somehow, in some way, united to the sufferings of Christ. And although salvation took place once and for all on Calvary with the death of the Lord there, where he died for our sins, our own sufferings somehow make that grace more tangible in this world and invite others to participate in it. And so Paul would realize over the decades of his ministry that the many sufferings that he would undergo were united with the sufferings of Christ and were fulfilling that initial understanding of his vocation that Ananias had, the suffering servant of the Lord in Paul the great apostle. Now he comes in to Ananias' presence, he's baptized, and he could see again. And really, he's able now to see for the first time. Now this moment of conversion, of a change of heart, of a metanoia, taking his heart of stone and making it human and humane is critically important for him in the history of the church. But at that moment, he probably didn't see it as a change of religion, but as a fulfillment of his religious hopes, his religious dreams, his religious desires, and not only his religious hopes, dreams, and desires, but the religious dreams, hopes, and desires of the people of Israel as such. Because of this radical turnaround, he was in trouble, and he has to escape from Damascus he doesn't go through the gates. He's lowered from a window in a basket through the wall and returns to Jerusalem where he wants to meet the other disciples who are quite understandably afraid of him. So they hide from him. But Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement, contacts the disciples tells them the story of what had happened and how Paul had proclaimed the Messiahship of Jesus in Damascus. And the disciples were amazed at the power of the grace of God, and they accepted him as one of their own. What an extraordinary tale. Some say, well, there's some slight contradictions between the conversion story in Galatians and here in Acts. But those are minor points. The great truth is that God intervened on the road to Damascus and all was changed forever. I hope you read chapter 9 of Acts and I pray that you'll be touched by it so that your heart may be in a constant state of conversion, becoming ever more humane and ever more holy day by day.